If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. This is part 2 of, we looked at this passage two weeks ago, and um, we're going to try to finish up with it today. Um, We're looking particularly at chapter 4, verses 21 through verse 1 of chapter 5. And we'll, uh, I'll read it this time as we go along during the sermon. We're talking about Isaac versus Ishmael. Um, would you please join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, in this portion of Galatians, uh, just a quick recap of two weeks ago, we're looking at Paul's final argument for justification by faith alone. Uh, This is the closing of the doctrinal section of this letter, and moving forward, he's going to start to to apply everything that he's been saying to us uh, so far. And this passage is uh, very relevant. Uh, It's hard to understand, I know, uh, but we'll be done with it this Sunday anyway. Uh, It's technical in nature like we talked about. Of course, the Jews of Paul's day would have followed his reasoning uh, probably a lot easier than we do. Uh, He uses allegory here. you know, so there's a lot of uh, his, his, he's referring a lot to Old Testament uh, characters. So there's, you know, the, understanding a passage like this presupposes a certain level of knowledge of the Old Testament and so forth. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, maybe hurdles for us to overcome, but it's important. And uh, it's, you know, part of God's word. So we need to be looking at it here. So Paul is giving us an analogy. And uh, last week we saw the analogy presented. And basically what Paul is doing here is he's talking about the Jews were always boasting in their lineage, you know, referring to Abraham as their father. And they had a false sense of security about that or because of that. They felt like Abraham's our father, and so all the promises that God made to Abraham are ours automatically because of our physical descent from Abraham. And so what Paul is wanting to do in this passage is he's wanting to use an analogy uh, to say there's more to it than that. And basically what he's saying is that, you know, Abraham had two sons. Uh, Ishmael and Isaac. And at the end of the day, the issue is not really who was your father. The issue is who was your mother. Uh, you know, not, not to these Jews, it's not so important who your father was, but the real issue is who was your mother. And so as he presented the analogy, Ishmael was born of Hagar, who was a maidservant and represents life under the law. What it, the covenant of works, the covenant of law, which in our world today uh, represents people that are still under the law, which were all of us at one time or another. We come into the world that way under the obligation, if you will, of living a perfect life and fulfilling the law. And if we don't, if we fail at any point, we're guilty of the whole thing. That's how we all start off. That side of things, that covenant of works or the law is represented by Hagar who had Ishmael. And um, by contrast, there's another covenant, the covenant of grace, the covenant uh, of salvation by faith, of believing the promise of God. That was Sarah and Isaac. Now, you'll remember that God had promised Abraham and Sarah a child. But when that didn't happen in their time frame, they took matters into their own hands. And Sarah told her husband to have relations with Hagar, 
and Ishmael was the result. So that whole side of things represents not a term unique with me, but a term I shared a couple of weeks ago, the flesh principle. And all of us can relate to the flesh principle, right? Basically trying to do God's will your way. Um, that's what Hagar and, and Ishmael represent, whereas uh, Sarah and Isaac represent God's promise, believing in God and, and uh, accepting uh, or doing things his way, so to speak. So we looked at all of that last time, and that was part one where Paul presented his analogy. Uh, so today we're going to look at, in part two, the analogy interpreted and then the analogy applied. So we're picking up then with verse 24 through verse 27, the analogy interpreted. Galatians 4, 24 to 27, Paul says, This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Okay, Paul's going to interpret his analogy for us here. He says there are two sons and two mothers representing two covenants. Hagar and Ishmael represent the covenant of law and works, and Sarah and Isaac represent the covenant of grace and faith. Now Paul deals with Hagar and Ishmael first. She is the one, verse 24 tells us, proceeding from Mount Sinai. Okay, you'll remember Mount Sinai is where God gave the law, right? And he said, do this or die. Hagar represents this covenant. She was a slave and all her kids were slaves. Paul carries the analogy a bit further in verse 25. He says that Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, meaning that anyone in this covenant is in Arabia which is outside of the promised land. In other words, if you follow this covenant, which means if you're approaching God on the basis of trying to keep the law, which is what Hagar represents, then you're a child of Hagar's, you're a brother of Ishmael's from Mount Sinai, and as such, you're in Arabia, which is outside of the promised land. Land. You're outside, in other words, of the realm of God's presence and God's blessing. That's what he's saying. So the issue here, like we already said, is not who is your mother, but who is your father. Uh, I'm sorry, not who your father is, like the Judaizers claim, but who is your mother. It's no big deal, Paul says, who your father is. Because Abraham had two sons, and two lineages. So the issue is which lineage do you fall under? Who is your mother? Now Paul's not through yet. He carries his analogy even further. Okay, So far we have Hagar equals Ishmael equals Mount Sinai equals Arabia outside of the promised land and the place of God's blessing. But notice also in verse 25 that this lineage corresponds to or answers to the present Jerusalem. Hagar is also symbolic of Jerusalem today. Earthly, physical Jerusalem. And just as Mount Sinai was the place where God gave the law, So Jerusalem was his appointed place where the law would be propagated and upheld. So Jerusalem in this passage represents the old covenant 
of law and works and the bondage they produce. The illustration of Hagar and Mount Sinai in Arabia and the present Jerusalem applies to anyone who is trying to do God's will in the flesh. It represents anyone who seeks to be saved by ritual or good works, by their own merits, you know, things like that. That's the first part of the analogy. In contrast to this, we see that Sarah, verse 26, allegorically represents Isaac, who represents the Jerusalem above, which represents promise, which represents faith, which represents freedom. That's the other side of it. The spiritual descendants of Sarah through Isaac live in the Jerusalem above and are free because she's our mother if we are among those who live by faith in God's promise given to Abraham and fulfilled ultimately in Christ. In other words, if you're a Christian. Okay, you remember in Philippians 3.20, Paul tells us that as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. That's another way, or, or you could say the Jerusalem above. And as inhabitants of this heavenly Jerusalem, we're free from the law, from works, from bondage. We're free, unlike those who are citizens of the present Jerusalem, to serve God from the heart. Okay, Not because we're trying to earn our salvation. Not because we're trying to climb the ladder of acceptance in the eyes of God. We don't have to live life wondering if we've done enough. That's how people have to live who think they can earn their salvation. Have I ever done enough? What happens when I have a bad day? Does that knock me back a few rails? You know, that kind of thing. Well, Paul continues his analogy in verse 27, and here he's quoting Isaiah 54, 1. Notice what he says. Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Paul speaks here of a barren woman who all of a sudden rejoices in the fact that she has more children than the one who is never desolate to begin with. Now, what does he mean? Well, the city above, the heavenly Jerusalem, of which all Christians are a part, at one time in history was desolate. But then Christ came, he went to the cross, he died, and then he ascended, and he scooped up all the saints, all the Christians in the Old Testament, and he led them to heaven. And the city above is no longer desolate. And since that time, the Jerusalem above, or we could say heaven, will continue to be populated with true Christians until God gathers all of his people. And so the ultimate statement of that verse is that in the end, the Jerusalem above is going to be greater than the Jerusalem below. Or as Paul words it in verse 27, more will be the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. So... We have two sons representing two mothers who represent two covenants and two Jerusalems. One represents bondage and law and legalism, while the other represents the promise and freedom and faith. And so again, Paul says the issue is not who your father is, like the Judaizers claim, but rather who is your mother. And which lineage do you belong to? So we see Paul's analogy presented. We see it interpreted. And finally, we see his analogy applied. Look at verse 28 and following. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. 
But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So here Paul gives us the outcome or what we can expect, see, based on which side of the lineage we belong to. He says in verse 28 that if we're Christians, we're like Isaac, not Ishmael. That's what side of the lineage we're on. And what follows is this. If we're like Isaac, then first of all, we can expect the same thing that Isaac got. We should expect the same treatment that he got. And how was he treated? Look at verse 29. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. You remember the ceremony um, at which Isaac was weaned. He was probably about three years old. His half-brother Ishmael, who was probably around 17 at the time, ridiculed him. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 21. Isaac was the object of Ishmael's scorn, of his mockery. And what Paul is telling us here is that we too should expect the same thing. The Ishmaels uh, or the descendants of Ishmael will continue to persecute the descendants of Isaac. Christians will continue to be persecuted by the Ishmaels of this world. And most of that persecution will come from the religious segment of society, just like it was true in the days of those two men. The true church, think of it like this, will be persecuted by our half-brothers, the religious people of the day. And we should expect it, Paul says, personally, and corporately, okay? Especially in our day and age, if we're living evangelistically as Christians, okay? And remember in the past, we've distinguished between an evangelical Christian and what it means to live evangelistically. Our churches, conservative churches of all denominations, are full of evangelicals. That's a statement about what someone believes, what ties evangelicals together all across the world is that we all believe certain basic things. We believe in the, the Bibles and the inspired Word of God. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died, that He ro rose from the dead. That's what makes someone an evangelical. But I can be an evangelical my whole life and never be persecuted. All I have to do is remain silent about my faith. That's the difference between being evangelical and living evangelistically in this world. If we live evangelistically, if we open our mouths about what we believe to people, if we believe John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, and we speak those words to people, you're going to be met with resistance at times. So I can be evangelical, but not evangelistic. Well, secondly, we must not only expect persecution, but on a brighter note, we can also expect an inheritance. Look at verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Even though Isaac had to endure the persecution of his half-brother Ishmael, he was the one who became heir of his father Abraham and received an inheritance. And in the same way, it's those who belong to the lineage of Isaac, those who come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, who will inherit the promise of heaven. 
and eternal life and will enter into God's rest forever. All the promises God made to Abraham will be yours if you're a true Christian. Well, Paul closes this section with a final exhortation in chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Paul says that Christ has set us free from thinking that we can earn our salvation by keeping the law. We could never earn our salvation. Christ did that for us. And he, Paul says, remember that. Don't go back to thinking you have to work at making it to heaven, trying to get to heaven. Well, the obvious question as we conclude then, I've already asked it, but really the obvious question is to which lineage do you belong? Are you an Ishmael? Or are you an Isaac? The whole human race can be put into one of those two categories. The Ishmaels of this world, see, are those who are trusting in themselves, their own righteousness, their own track record to get to heaven. They're the ones who hope that when they stand before God at the end of their lives, that the good will outweigh the bad in their lives, and that based on that, God will receive them. God will let them into heaven. The problem, you see, with that kind of thinking is that the Bible says something completely different. We read it in our responsive reading. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works lest any man should boast. So if salvation is not a result of my works, it has to be something else. It can't be both. <clears throat> also, the Bible tells us that we're all great big sinners, that we're all guilty, we're all condemned to die. The Bible tells us that even our righteous deeds, even the greatest things I would ever do, are as filthy rags before the Lord. When I understand his perfection and his holiness, Habakkuk says his eyes are too pure to even look at iniquity. When I begin to understand that, I realize I'm in a, a dire situation. By contrast, the Isaacs of this world are those who realize that. Those who have come to a place in their lives where they realize that they're sinners that they can't save themselves. They've come to a place in their lives where they realize they need to be rescued, not just helped, but actually rescued. And so as a result, they've turned away from sin. They've turned to Jesus Christ. They've received him into their lives by faith, through prayer, like the prayer we have at the end of these sermons most of the time. And they've turned the deed of their lives over to him. They've received the gift of eternal life. How about you? Are you an Ishmael? Are you an Isaac? Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed this morning, to which side of the lineage do you belong? Are you an Ishmael or have you become an Isaac? You see, we all start off from the time we're born as Ishmaels. The Bible says we all are born sinful and separated from God. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus you must be born again. How does that happen? That happens when I... Come to Christ, truly, personally. The church can't do it for me. My upbringing can't do it for me. I have to personally do that. Come to Him. If you've never truly done that, you can do it right now. As you hear this message, you can pray these words silently as I pray them aloud. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner, that I'm guilty, 
But I also recognize that you love me so much. You came into this world. You lived a perfect life. And then you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Right now, would you come into my heart? Would you cleanse me? Would you give me the gift of eternal life? And from this moment on, would you make me the kind of person that you want me to be? Amen.